Um, next, I'd like to introduce our uh, next speaker, Dr. Chris Johnston. Um, his bio is in the um, program on, on, in the uh, in the interest of time, I won't read the whole thing, but uh, he is the chair of the Minnesota Department of Human Services Opioid Prescribing Work Group, and uh, will be talking to us today about the opioid epidemic and the medical journey and how we created a public health crisis. Uh, Dr. Johnston. Hi. You are. Hello. Thank you. All right. So is this on? Can you hear me? Um, hello, everyone. Um, good, good morning. Um, uh, it is my pleasure to be here, and I'm going to begin today's talk um, by offering an apology. Um, make no mistake, my profession did this. The medical profession did this. This is why we're here today, we're going to talk about how that happened. Um, a little background on, uh, on me. Um, I'm not originally from the upper Midwest, Minneapolis. Uh, I went to medical school at the Medical College of Virginia, uh, former capital of the Confederacy. Um, and they never got over that, really. Um, but uh, uh, I've made my home in Minneapolis since the year 2000 when I went to train there for emergency medicine. And um, I trained at Hennepin County Medical Center. And I saw quite a bit of prescription opiate and uh, drug abuse problems uh, when I was in training as a resident. But the thing is, when you work in a county hospital, you can kind of blow it off a little bit because you deal with a county population. You see a lot of destroyed families, um, incarcerations, uh, damaged social structures, and you kind of say, oh yeah, well, this, this population, you might expect that. But then I went to work at a community hospital when I graduated 2003, and it became quite apparent that, oh my God, it's everywhere. It's in Edina, posh suburb, St. Louis Park, Minnetonka. And that began my investigation into the source of this problem, and I've been working on this for over 10 years now. Um, and here's what we're gonna do, we're gonna talk about it, number one, uh, my goals today, the problem, uh, we're going to go through the numbers. You're all here because you kind of already know the numbers, but we're just going to review them. Um, the United States was not like this 15 years ago. This has been a dramatic change in the culture of medicine in this country. Number two, why it happened. Um, I'm going to have to disagree with one of my, uh, uh, Dr. Sapala. Uh, this was not an accident. This wasn't intentions gone awry. This was engineered. All right. Why it persists. Um, we've had bad data on the scientific evidence of opioid abuse and overdose since at least 2007, and nothing has really changed. I'm going to argue that the incentives in medicine right now are poorly suited to fix this crisis. If it were about the science and patient safety, we'd have fixed it already, but we haven't. What can we do to solve? Oh, my Mac doesn't do this. Um, <laughs> What can we do to solve this problem? Um, I'm going to argue we need a societal response. Again, medicine by itself has proven completely incapable of fixing it. And my final take home point is all opiates are heroin, and there is nothing special about heroin. There's nothing moral or immoral. It just is what it is. So the problem, why are we talking about this? Well, brief history of opiates. We've used opiates as, as medicines going back as far as written civilization, uh, Greece, Assyria, Persia. And the traditional method of um, obtaining opium for use was this. This is the poppy seed of the opium poppy, Papaver somniferum, that comes from Roman mythology. Um, the Roman god Somnus was the god of sleep. And the, and the god Somnus uh, first appeared in uh, uh, Ovid's Metamorphoses, you guys remember the 15-volume epic poem about the history of the world up until Julius Caesar? It was, uh, I thought the first nine volumes flew by, <laughs> but the last six, um, whew, get to the Rubicon. Um, in any case, so what you did is you took the seed pod, you made a slice there, and you collected the milky substance, and you dried it out, and the internet it says it looks like this, so I believe it. Um, <laughs> and... Raw opium contains about 12% morphine, and morphine is also named after mythology. Morpheus was the Greek god of dreams. And this is morphine here, and this is codeine, which is also found in the opium poppy. And the really only difference is this methyl group here and the hydroxyl group there. And the body just makes codeine into morphine just naturally, typically. Um, and these medicines um, treat pain in two primary ways. One is that opiates actually do have a signal a uh, blocking effect on the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. You touch something hot, signal tra travels up your arm. Well, opiates do block the intensity of that signal, but more importantly, opiates affect your mood. 
Pain is an emotional experience, sort of like all of life is. And by adjusting your, your, emotion, your mood at the time, it affects your experience of pain. And what it does is, like Dr. Sopala said, is that it affects dopamine in your reward center. So here is your brain on the left in your, your normal state, and you've got a bit of dopamine coming down here, and your brain feels like, meh, I'm okay. And then what happens is with opiates, opiates bind this mu receptor here. This is an inhibitory neurotransmitter called GABA. It inhibits the inhibitor. Get, uh, then dopamine floods your reward center, and your brain says, oh my god, that was awesome. But remember, the only reason these compounds do anything is you make a receptor for opiates. We are all on some version of morphine. That's what endorphins are, endogenous morphine or endorphins. So fascinating, what's the problem? Um, the problem is these compounds also bind receptors in the brainstem and in high enough doses slow down your breathing or stop your breathing and then you will die of a cardiac arrest shortly thereafter as the heart can only survive a few minutes without oxygen. So why are we talking about this? We're talking about this because the United States contains 5% of the world's population, but we consume 80% of the world's opiate pain relievers. We are off the charts compared to the nations we like to consider our developed peers. Here is the United States opiate use per capita, and here is Western Europe, and we are about three to five times more per person than any nation in Europe. So that looks crazy. Has it always been like this? No, it has not always been like this. Back in the early 90s uh, to mid-90s, we were prescribing about 85 to 90 million prescriptions of opiates for pain each and every year. And then look what happened in the last 15 years. This actually goes up to 2012, but actually we're up more around 230 million per year today. And here's what has happened. We're dying. In the year 2001, we had about 4,500 to 5,000 accidental prescription opiate overdose deaths. And in the year 2014, we were almost at 19,000, a 300% increase. Now to convey what that kind of looks like, 19,000 is six World Trade Centers and you're still about 900 short, one year. If you totaled up the number of Americans who have died of accidental prescription overdose in the last 15 years, you're almost at 190,000. And if, that wants, if you want to know what that looks like, that is more than the number of US soldiers who died in the European theater in World War II. But prescription opiates are only part of the problem. We have another problem now, and that is heroin. Mirroring the rise in the prescription opiate epidemic is now the heroin and illicit fentanyl epidemic. Three out of four users of heroin and, heroin and illicit opiates began with prescriptions. And here, here's what the death tolls from heroin has looked like in the last uh, 14 years. Steady, 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 then boop, in the late, late 2000s, as people found it more difficult to get their prescriptions, they turned to the cheaper alternative heroin, and this is what has happened. Um, and the deaths are only part of the problem. This is the iceberg of misery from addiction, right? This is, this is this one person who overdoses and dies. You still have 15 abuse treatment admissions, 26 ER visits, and many more who are abused or dependent and then used recreationally, all at terrible cost. Cost to the healthcare system, of course, but also you don't have to die to ruin your life and your finances and your family um, with opiate dependence and addiction. So how did this all happen? Um, I would like to be able to tell you that it was a, sort of a perfect storm of good intentions gone awry, it was the wrong place, wrong time, boy, doctors are busy, patients want to get a move on, quick fix culture, but I can't do that honestly because we have always been like that. The real reason that we are here is over the last 20 something years, the pharmaceutical industry has exerted extraordinary new control over the medical field in this country. Again, I can count. <laughs> um, so this is the sort of playbook that the opiate manufacturers use to sort of capture the medical industry and get more of their product to the market. One, recruit thought leaders, otherwise known as key opinion leaders. At these are the leading academic institutions, the leading pain clinics um, who, who those of us, uh, I mean, we've, we, the whole, all of humanity, like we follow our faculty, we follow our teachers, we trust our leaders. 
All right, so their job is to shape the, 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 uh, the agenda for the rest of the medical community. So get a hold and influence them. The second thing that the opiate manufacturers did, which was different, is market directly to primary care doctors with gifts and incentives. Um, a number, number one, influence government and regulatory bodies to approve pro um, new products and mandate pain rec control requirements. And then finally, blur the line between academic societies and patient advocacy groups, um, the message being far more compelling when it comes from you know, uh, citizens against pain um, than it does from uh, a well-dressed and attractive Purdue Pharma representative. Tactic number one, recruit pain specialists at leading institutions. Um, their job is to convince the rest of us in the medical community um, that this is the new way we should be treating pain. Now, there were a number of uh, doctors that were targeted, but probably the most prominent one was this gentleman, Dr. Russell Portnoy, who was the president of the American Pain Society. Um, he was the subject of the Wall Street Journal article, A Pain Drug Champion Has Second Thoughts, written in December 2012, and he, his stated goal was to rehabilitate the medical community of opiophobics. Uh, as president of the American Pain Society in 1995, he was, in, he was the one who sort of came up with the idea that pain is the fifth vital sign, which I never understood. Um, as an emergency doctor, I was, you know, I, I thought that a persistent blood pressure of 60 over 40 with a temperature of 103 and someone who is septic might be dying, as opposed to the person on their phone watching television saying their pain was 10 out of 10. But I was told, or, or 100 out of 10. I mean, there's no limit on like math, math, mathematical implausibilities. Anyway. Um, but we were told that we're to take pain levels as potentially as threatening to their life or, or long-term health as these other measurements, um, emphasizing the need to get those, get those pain numbers down. Um, in 1996, Dr. Portnoy authored a position statement um, published in the Clinical Journal of Pain, stating that the, the risk of addiction to prescribed opiates if you had pain was less than 1%. Less than 1%. Do you guys know where that came from? came to us from the, from the New England Journal of Medicine, a study in 1980 called Porter and Jick. Um, red flags should be going off right now in your head. Why? All right, so um, 1980. Then suddenly, 16 years later, they figure out that, oh, opiates aren't addictive, and we knew this for 16 years. That should, t that should be suspicious. All right, so we're going to go through the study that proves that opiates aren't addictive. Are you ready? You can do the whole thing right now, that's it. This is the study. It's a five sentence letter to the editor. This is the study that showed that opiates weren't addictive for pain. You can read it in 90 seconds. And basically what, what they did was, and first of all, Porter and Jick was, did, didn't argue that opiates aren't addictive. They just observed that they tracked about 12,000 patients who were admitted to a hospital, had a dose of opiate pain medicine for an acute injury, and in those circumstances, didn't mention anything about going home with a prescription, but in those circumstances, addiction was rare. That's all it said. So that opiates can be safe when used briefly for an acute injury. So it really wasn't so much a study as a tweet. <laughs> but what they focused on was that if you had an acute injury, you had pain. If you had pain, then you couldn't become addicted. It ignored the fact that that was just a brief exposure. And this is where the, I, I would say, this was the great failure of, of, of science uh, and medical ethics. Um, that study, the Porter and Jick, is an, uh, what's called an observation study. They look afterwards and say, okay, well, you, you can use a lot of opiates, but in these circumstances, it seems to, not, you know, it seems to be okay. All right, that's called an observation. What you have to do then is then form a question. Does that mean opiates aren't addictive for all patients in pain? Generate the hypothesis, and then you do an experiment before you lead to a conclusion. They skipped that part. Now, how do we know they skipped that part? Because the National Institutes of Health looked for it. In 2014, part of their Pathways to Prevention program, they researched all the studies on using opiates for chronic pain, and not one study went longer than 12 weeks, and most just went six. So what does Dr. Portnoy say now? Um, in a taped interview in 2010, I gave innumerable lectures about addiction in the 80s and 90s that weren't true. Clearly, if I had an inkling of what I know now then, I wouldn't have spoken the way I spoke. Um, by the way, he got paid millions at, uh, by, by makers of pharmaceuticals to his pain clinic at Beth Israel Hospital in New York. Um, 
Tactic two, market relentlessly to the primary care doctors. Why is this new? Um, well, prior to the 1990s, um, uh, the marketing of pain medicines, especially long-acting pain medicines, was the purview of cancer doctors and pain specialists. But that changed with this product, OxyContin, released by Purdue Pharma in 1996 as a continuous release preparation of the very unsexy and old opiate, oxycodone. And why would they target primary care? Because this is where most of the opiates come from. Why are, why are you targeting the pain specialists um, when the bulk of opiates come from primary care, general practitioners, family practitioners? So that is why they targeted them. Um, they distributed uh, sales and marketing materials, um, uh, including a video saying, I got my life back, featuring seven people who talks about how their lives have been transformed and restored with the, uh, with the miracle drug of OxyContin. Um, actually, Anthony Bourdain, I don't know if you ever watched this show. I love this show. Um, Anthony Bourdain's Parts Unknown on CNN, sort of a series of cultural essays uh, from different parts of the world. Well, I mean, he did an episode in Massachusetts, and the Massachusetts episode in 2014 was about heroin and OxyContin. And they got a hold of the video, and here's the Purdue Pharma video. Less than 1% become addicted, distributed to clinics and to patients. Um, swank resorts, all expenses paid, primary care doctors, pain specialists, nurses, pharmacists, everyone was included. They even had a starter coupon program where your first prescription of OxyContin was free. Now tell me that isn't like the creepy guy outside the high school. <laughs> your little bag, because I'm your friend. 30,000 people used that program before it was discontinued. They even had CDs get in the swing with OxyContin. Tactic three, influence government and regulatory bodies change the rules about pain control to favor more aggressive drug prescribing and administration. Um, they, drug companies kind of control the FDA at this point. Uh, this really began in the early 1990s with the passage of the Prescription Drug and User Fee Act of 1992. This act um, uh, suddenly transformed the FDA where 50% of their budget was the industry. This was born out of the AIDS crisis, actually. Um, the FDA was under pressure because we had all these people who were dying of HIV. We can't get, you know, we have these, these drugs, they might help, we need to get them improved. Um, uh, and so they took their money, and uh, basically ever since then, they've had a hard time saying no to the industry. And they changed the rules about opiates um, for long-term pain at the assistance of advocacy groups, saying pain is undertreated. That's when we had this, the Joint Commission with their zero to 10 scale. You gotta get those numbers down. Um, uh, tactic four, blur the line between advocacy and advertising. Partners against pain. Um, you have, you, pain is nothing that you have to go through alone, you have a partner. I mean, who would be against that? They're helping pain and loneliness. But this is pure unbranded outreach. That is a creation of Purdue Pharma. And this is the former president of the American Academy of Pain Management. We have an epidemic on our hands and the status quo is failing us. But the American Academy of Pain Management, pain Management has a corporate council and look who's on it. Manufacturers of opiates. Unbi unbiased advocacy, one of, the, one of these groups, the American Pain Foundation, was actually shut down in 2012 when far from being a grassroots organization, it was revealed that it was basically a corporate mouthpiece for pharma. 90% of their money came from the industry. Um, but the plan worked. Chronic pain was then uh, uh, believed to be an undertreated epidemic and opiates were safe and effective um, at helping people reclaim their lives. But is it really an epidemic and do the people really reclaim their lives? Well. One of the most common causes of chronic pain is arthritis. Do we say arthritis is an epidemic? This is an epidemic. Low background, then at a peak phase, and then a resolution phase. Well, if something is up here, that just means it's widespread and kind of like life. That's not an epidemic. And uh, so do people actually reclaim their lives with these medicines? Well, you couldn't tell it from disability. Disability's been nothing but go up. And this, like again, this is early 1990 through the 2000s. Um, and the number one and two causes of disability are back and joint pain. These are the conditions these medicines told us we're gonna solve. Oh, and, the, and that video about people reclaiming their life, well, two are dead. Three became addicted, two of them died, both well actively addicted. So why are we still doing do this? Still doing this medicine is big business in this country. Um, since 2008, oh, I'm sorry. I'm running out of time, but this is from a year in performance review. Chris, we are also proud of the work you're doing with chronic pain, but it's such a fine line between risk of addiction and HCAP scores. HCAP scores. Those are patient satisfaction surveys, been in used in 2008. 
During your hospital stay, did you need medicine for your pain? During your hospital stay, how often was your pain well controlled? During this hospital stay, did the hospital staff do everything they could to help you with your pain? Doctors are being graded on how well patients react to their visits, and they were given precious little time to do it. Um, you know, we use terms like throughput to describe efficiency of a medical system. Throughput was originally a term to describe the efficiency of a factory line. So doctors with no time, they need to make patients happy and get the, basically all you have time to do is sit down and tell the patient, well, what do you want? And so the path of least resistance happens. How do we know this? December Annals of Internal Medicine 2015, they studied almost 3,000 overdose patients who went to the ER or admitted the hospital and in 90% of those cases for an opiate overdose, they were back on prescribed opiates within two months. And in 70% of those cases, it was from the same doctor that prescribed the opiate before the overdose. So it is time to change. First of all, let's admit all opiates are heroin. There's nothing remarkable about heroin. Heroin is diacetylmorphine. And here it is. It has a, it has a chemical structure. It was a, in fact, it wasn't even a street name. Heroin comes to us from Bayer Pharmaceuticals in the late 1890s. Um, uh, and so it's not even a street drug, but, but here it is. You take a morphine molecule, and here's an acetyl group. You put one molecule there and another one there, diacetylmorphine. But look, the structure is the same. Hydromorphone, hydrocodone, oxycodone, the ring structure, the brain receptor is the same. In fact, if you were in the United Kingdom and had a kidney stone or fell with an angulated fracture and went to the ER, you would likely get two milligrams of heroin, and you would be grateful. Now, they'd call it diamorph, but, but again, emphasizing that these drugs are all the same, the brain treats them the same. So we need to stop putting patients on these, on these, chronic, on these medicines for chronic pain. Again, once you develop opioid use disorder, uh, this is from a study just published April 2017, almost one in five are dead within 10 years from opiate use disorder. Kaiser Foundation study, 34 patients taking opiates for two months or longer became dependent or addicted. So just within two months, you can change the brain. Then finally, May 2017, just this past month, the SPACE trial was published out of the VA. They studied opiates versus non-opiates for chronic pain for a year. There was no difference in pain control, but there was higher adverse reactions, confirming what we'd been seeing in the public health data all this time. So my task going forward is we need major overhaul of the healthcare system that emphasizes quick visits and selling of healthcare services rather than patient outcomes. Um, we need to put the FDA back in the hands, not of, the, of, the, of corporate medicine, but of the patients. And um, we need increased access to chemical dependency treatment. And can we stop with the moral talk about addiction? If you believe this is a moral issue, you have an extraordinary conclusion to make. Then as you follow the increased sales, and almost on the same slope, deaths and treatment admissions go up, then what an extraordinary coincidence. As the sales went up, you had a remarkable increase in the number of immoral people in this country. <laughs> so this is my final slide. Uh, I conclude with this because um, uh, whenever I give my talks, I try to emphasize the fact that by restricting access to opioids and arguing for less use of them, uh, uh, dr dramatic less use of them, I am not trying to punish anyone. I am not trying to make people suffer. I've seen lots of patients who are opiate dependent and have chronic, it's, it's a miserable life. That's all they think about that day is getting that script. By arguing for these reforms and changes in the medical culture, I want to help people who have, have, have suffered. Oh, by the way, despair actually literally means without hope. It, it's from the Latin word spero. We want to restore hope and prevent those who have not yet developed the problem of addiction and opiate dependence with chronic pain from entering that world of misery. And that's my goal. And thank you so much. Thank you.